Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have just a fantabulous show for you today. I think that's a word. There's a lot of news to get into. The election is a mere 61 days away. Both candidates hitting the campaign trail and making their respective cases to the American people. We will tell you how this is all shaking out shortly. We'll also be telling you about alleged corruption involving a New York official who is charged with spying for China. The indictment says the official was bribed with millions of dollars as well as the Chinese delicacy of salted duck. Yummy. And we'll have journalist Michael Schellenberger on to discuss the showdown between Brazil and Elon Musk and what's going on with Germany's elections. But for right now, let's get to our lead story. We're just nine weeks out from the election and less than one week out from the first presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. The latest USA Today Suffolk poll shows Harris now leading Trump 48 percent to 43 percent nationally, an edge that is, however, within the poll's margin of error. Politico also shared a roundup of polls, all showing Harris with a narrow lead. Nate Silver and The Economist both have Harris leading Trump by 3.5 points. Politico writes that, quote, Trump has yet to find an attack on Harris that sticks, and, quote, if Harris doesn't falter next week, there's a reason to believe that she may be uniquely positioned to expand her numbers with swing voters in key states. But 538's Nate Silver warned Americans, quote, what's made this race uniquely challenging to forecast is there hasn't really been a slow news cycle since the debate on June 28th that doomed Joe Biden. Pollster Frank Lutz says there were two issues that could sway the outcome of the election. Let's watch. I think what matters are the two issues that the public says they prioritize in this election, which is affordability, not inflation, but affordability of food and fuel, housing and health care, and the idea that that's gotten worse over the last three years, not better, and immigration, which is basically an issue of personal security and safety and whether the border is controlled or not. She, Vice President Harris, has a clear advantage in personality. If this is an election about who you trust, who you have confidence in, who you like, she wins clearly. If this is an election about policy, about where things have gone over the last three and a half years and where they're headed, Donald Trump has the advantage. The problem with the Trump campaign is that the candidate himself is actually undermining that message with personal attacks that voters don't like. The challenge with Harris is that she walks into a union hall and doesn't address the two issues that union people prioritize the most. Now, meanwhile, MSNBC's Morning Joe said Trump's campaign team is getting desperate. Let's watch. The claims are so outrageous. They're, they're, they're so disconnected from the truth. Uh, Trump moving all over the place on issues from abortion to immigration, now saying we need more immigrants in the United States. All, all of this stuff, the, the crazy stuff at Arlington, they're just they're absolutely desperate. And the campaign has said internally they know they can never bring Don. They can't make people like Donald Trump. Right. So their goal is to make people hate Kamala Harris. Yes. And that's where we are. Uh, as and, and if they can't get Americans to hate Kamala Harris, then they understand she will win. Hmm. I had a, an epiphany in a dream last night, Robbie. I had committed a crime. I don't know what crime, but I knew that I had to flee the country and go to Mexico. And I had this realization that Trump's campaign team is always saying, well, Trump mostly, is always saying that they're sending criminals across the border when it's literally a trope in the United States that criminals go to Mexico to flee the law. And I just found that interesting with the whole immigrant narrative that's going on. What do you make of what Morning Joe is saying there? Hmm. Well, look, they can say the Trump campaign is desperate, but the truth is that this election is as close as it could possibly be right now. And Trump is very much still in it, and depending on you know how you read the uh, the tea leaves, um, he he's he could be ahead or a little bit behind. Or it's exactly tied. I mean, that's the gist of what Nate Silver wrote in uh, the the piece we referenced there. That like yes, Kamala Harris is up nationally, but national poll doesn't matter. What matters is who wins in the swing states. And since uh, in since the convention in recent weeks, there have not been there are strong polls showing her winning 
Pennsylvania, which is the must-win state. If only there was something she could have done to get a couple more votes in Pennsylvania. Hmm, I wonder what that might have been. But she didn't, so here we are. Um, yes, she could very much well win if you want to make the argument that she's ahead. That argument is plausible based on the... Uh, the, the facts. You could also make the same argument about Donald Trump. It's close. So there's no desperation from the campaign. Um, but yes, they are trying to find the right uh, uh, means of attacking her, of assailing her. And I think that should be based on her just repeated flip-flopping over the years that she tried to write off in that interview with Dana Bash last week. is like, well, my values haven't changed, but you've fundamentally changed your opinion on uh, energy mandates, whether we all have to get electric vehicles by 2040, um, on decriminalizing the border. You, you do not stand by the answer you gave in the debates in 2020 when you raised your hand and said that should be decriminalized. And so many other issues. So that's what they should be going after her on. Now, I don't know that Trump now always or necessarily has the discipline to focus on those issues instead of attacking her for you know, the way she looks and all the rest of that kind of stuff that doesn't help him. But um, that's what they should be doing. Yeah, I think the Trump campaign is going to have a hard time criticizing Kamala Harris for flip-flopping on the issues because Trump's known to do that uh, in a shorter time span, not years in between the policy changes, but just weeks and sometimes days. I think that's why they're sticking to, you know, these criticisms of Kamala Harris that have not stuck. It's like throwing spaghetti on the wall and it keeps falling off. It started with uh, Kamala Harris hates Jewish people. Her husband is Jewish, so they dropped that attack line. That one didn't stick. Then she's not even black. She went She went to a black, uh, uh, a historically black college, was in a black sorority. And this idea that they post photos of her in traditional Indian dress during times of celebration and say, look at this evidence that she's not black, not realizing people can be multiracial. So that didn't stick. Um, he called Biden a bad Palestinian. And then we have the administration sending $3.5 billion to Israel. So saying Kamala Harris is in that camp isn't going to work. Tim Walz's stolen valor didn't stick. That they're cat ladies and they're lonely. That Harrington didn't go to Arlington when it turns out there was no event at Arlington. And in fact, Trump should not have been campaigning there. That she laughs too much when in fact she just has joy. That you know, they're they're bad on women's reproductive issues. It turns out Trump has has wavered on that, has said, you know what, now we're going to have free IVF and my campaign is going to be great for reproductive rights. And actually, we're, we're rolling back where we stand on abortion, you know, lying about his tax record, calling her the border czar when it turns out he's the one that tanked the border bill. It's just every issue that he's had with Kamala Harris ends up you know, completely boomeranging and hurting his campaign. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's not hurting him that much. They're, again, they're in a virtual tie right now. I think some of the things he's hit Harris Walls for that you just mentioned um, are effective and some are less effective. Um, I don't see that Tim Walls has done her any good uh, whatsoever. Conservatives have gone after uh, his s series of serial exaggerations about his uh, rec his military record, um, you know, his claims that he had, that his family did IVF. They did not. They did IUI, totally different thing. Um, not as contentious as IVF. Um, his his uh, misstatements he had made uh, way back when about his drunk driving arrest. Um, you know, I do not think this is a addition to the ticket that has actually really helped her at all when, again, there was a plausible uh, VP pick who would have perhaps made the difference in the must-win state of Pennsylvania, but she decided not to do that. You know, in terms of the policy issues, Trump voters want and trust Trump on the economy and on immigration on every issue except abortion, which is why he's gone out of his way to assure that there will be no national federal abortion policy. That's what he has said. That is what his main rival, Nikki Haley, said, too, when she was running. There is no plan for Republicans to propose a national abortion ban. The issue will be left to the states. Trump has said in his own state, uh, of Florida, that the six-week ban is too uh, is too strict, and he doesn't support it. And uh, you know, so they're trying to chart a moderate course on abortion. If you want to call that a flip-flop, so be it. But um, I think he is quite effectively trying to neutralize um, that issue and then capitalize on his natural lead 
um, on the others. But as we said, it is extremely close. We'll have more rising, more analysis right after this. Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is set to testify next week before the House Oversight Committee on the COVID pandemic. The hearing is expected to focus on the guidance Cuomo issued in the early days of the pandemic that led to New York nursing homes admitting patients who had COVID-19. The committee chair, Republican Brad Wenstrup, said in a statement, quote, Andrew Cuomo owes answers to the 15,000 families who lost loved ones in New York's nursing homes during the COVID-19 pandemic. On September 10th, Americans will have the opportunity to hear directly from the former governor about New York's potentially fatal nursing home policies. Cuomo spokesperson said, quote, This committee has continued to engage in false political attacks blaming New York for nursing home deaths despite the fact that New York was following guidance from former President Trump's CDC and CMS. More than a dozen other states, Democratic and Republican, followed the same guidance, or as one of those states' leaders, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, put it, this was federal guidance, this was what everyone was doing. The hearing is another part of Cuomo's continued fall from grace. You'll remember Cuomo was treated as a star and a hero during the beginning of the pandemic. Here he is with his brother Chris Cuomo on CNN back in May of 2020. This was the actual swab that was being used to fit up that double barrel shotgun that you have mounted on the front of your pretty face. Another time, Chris Cuomo asked his brother uh, whether he was considering running for president given his popularity. Andrew Cuomo would then go on to write a book about his COVID heroism. But following sexual harassment allegations from 11 women, this is what happened in August of 2021. I think that given the circumstances, the best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. Hmm. Now, this was a, a huge scandal. I remember being in the tri-state area. I had friends whose grandparents were in nursing homes. New York's a very densely populated city. Of course, it's an Im impossible thing to make policy during a pandemic, but you've got to if you're the governor of a state. And it's true that the federal guidelines did suggest that if a patient had been determined to be healed at the hospital and it was not necessary for them to, to be there, they could go home including if their home is a nursing home. And so following that guidance in a state like New York is difficult because the nursing homes are much more densely populated there than say a nursing home in the Midwest. And so it's a difficult decision, but he didn't have to lie about how many deaths there were and try and cover that up. That was the part of this that I think just really made it a, a failure on the governor's behalf. Right. Yeah. Let's be very clear here. So first of all, the the discharging the patients is the issue is that this was people who had COVID who were infectious who are now stable and didn't necessarily need to be the hospital anymore and the policy was to return them to the nursing homes to make you know to make room at the hospital for for more seriously sick people the problem with doing that is older people are the by far the most at risk for a negative COVID health outcome. So even if you have someone who's stable, you return them to nursing home, that was spreading the disease in the nursing homes. And that was a terrible idea. Now you're right that that was actually, you know, federal suggestion. And then the New York State uh, Health State Department, the New York Health Department of that state decreed to do that. And many other states did as well, because that was guidance from the federal government. Um, but Cuomo, as you note, also then covered up the deaths resulting from that, pretended the problem didn't exist, wrote a book uh, lionizing his old his handling of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, minimizing the number of deaths that occurred because of that. And that is an, an additional level of unconscionable behavior. I would also, it, it's funny, he, you know, references Tim Walls there, who I've criticized previously on the show in a radar I did uh, on his COVID policies, which I think were absolutely disastrous. And he actually defended the, uh, the, the policy of readmitting, uh, of, of turning COVID patients back into nursing homes, um, even after it was clear that was a catastrophically bad idea that did result in a lot of people getting sick and, uh, and, and dying. So in some ways, that's worse because you shouldn't, it's one thing to say, well, it was a mistake and we didn't know better and everyone did it. Um, it's another thing to say, 
that we sh it was a I, I would still defend it given what uh, we know now. But anyway, yes, Quo uh, Cuomo deserves uh, the, the American people deserve answers from Cuomo on his cover up. I would remind everyone that he didn't actually end up resigning because of the COVID stuff, which was by far worse. He ended up re you know, resigning over um, sexual uh, misconduct uh, allegations, accusations from numerous um, uh, women, which uh, not to say that those are not serious or trivialize, trivialize them in any matter, but having presided over a policy that resulted in um, up to whatever that figure was, 15,000 deaths, and then covered it up, that's worse. <laughs> That's way worse. And it's, some, it's like they didn't want to reckon with, with his complicity in that, and so they ousted him on this much more pretextual um, uh, harassment charges. Right. I, I'm curious if Ron DeSantis is going to end up testifying before this committee as well. He is another governor during COVID. I was in Florida during COVID, and he tried to lock the state down. He did an all right job. I had to have my temperature taken, write down all of my information and my address as I crossed into the Florida border. Uh, I went there and stayed with a friend for a month right after the Bernie campaign ended. And he was taking the, the pandemic very, very seriously there in Florida. That didn't stop uh, Florida from becoming one of the states that was experiencing a very high number of cases and a high number of COVID deaths. And he is another governor like Andrew Cuomo that was found to be hiding the number of deaths. The, the auditor, the state auditor of Florida did a thorough investigation into the numbers released versus the real numbers. There were times when DeSantis was posting on Twitter saying we had no deaths today. That was not true. Uh, they had many more than zero deaths in that day, as was pointed out by this investigation. And so I would like to see them call Ron DeSantis to testify as well. Andrew Cuomo took a lot of heat for you know, covering up these deaths, but like the governor of Florida, like the governor of Minnesota, a lot of these people were simply following the guidelines of the federal government and the CDC under the Trump administration. But there were two governors, I have to point out, that did lie about the COVID numbers. And I think Andrew Cuomo ended up resigning because while he could say we're following the federal guidelines, I didn't know about the reporting. I didn't know the numbers were false. There's a, a whole line of people assessing the numbers and the information didn't get to me properly or get filled out properly. Things were crazy. It was a pandemic. We we're trying to figure everything out. He could have gotten away with it. But I think it really added to, to the fire that you had these women come forward while Andrew Cuomo was already swirled in controversy. So I think that's really what did it. But I would just like to see them uh, interview Ron DeSantis, ask him about what happened during COVID there in Florida. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with what you're, what you're referencing, the miscounting of deaths in, in Florida. Is that, is because he said at one point that we're counting, I actually think this was true, that it's probably been true everywhere, that they were counting some people who had died who had COVID when they died, but uh, is not, actually no. caused by so, COVID. They just happen to have COVID. Is that what you're referencing? That was a part of it, of him directly, you know, misrepresenting the numbers through his, you know, communication channels. But it was also the case that the data reported at the state level in Florida did not match the actual numbers. If you go through and look at the data reported actually by the hospitals and through the proper reporting channels in Florida, that the numbers that were being put out and reported under Ron DeSantis's administration were false. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the numbers, there were not <clears throat> widespread, there were not differences, significant differences in um, uh, deaths relative to the population and the health of the population. You know, Florida has a lot of older people living there, people who retired, moved to Florida. But that red states and blue states in general did not have very different death rates for the first half of the pandemic until the vaccine rollout and then there was some differences because there was more um, vaccine hesitancy where it would have helped um, older Americans in some states. But the point being for the first half, the mitigation efforts, even the stricter ones followed in blue states versus the laxer ones in red states because while red states did lock down, they were quicker to reopen and you know let people go to parks and beaches and things of that nature. Um, there was just there were that did not translate to a big difference in deaths. It was not the, the difference did not emerge um, until uh, until there was a slower um, vaccine uptake among vulnerable uh, Americans in some red states. Although Ron DeSantis, of course, was very enthusiastic about 
providing vaccines to everyone who wants one, not requiring it of anyone, it shouldn't be required, but of, uh, of partnering with uh, providers in the state of Florida to, uh, to, to do that rollout, and it, which was very, um, very praised, and he was very enthusiastic about that, so I think that was a good thing. Yeah, I can point to the exact numbers. So the auditor uh, of Florida found that the deaths were under undercounted by at least 3000. Ron DeSantis time and again said he didn't agree with the way that they were collecting the data and they're overcounting the number of deaths when actually his Department of Health was putting out numbers that were not accurate. So they went in and revised this. It, you know, it's true that it's difficult to make policy during a pandemic, but there's no reason to be dishonest or to lie about the numbers in your state as governor. But I think because of these political attacks, that's why they do it, right? Because Andrew Cuomo is going to be attacked for what? Following the, the CDC guidelines. And so he's incentivized then to lie about the numbers. I think we need to recognize that, you know, everyone was doing their best during the time of COVID. And I hope something good will come out of this committee more than just politics as usual and finger pointing at, at someone on the other team when you've got guys on your team that, that did similar things. Yeah, but nobody else, I mean, Cuomo wrote a book bragging about how good his pandemic response was uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, directed his staff to minimize the number of nursing home deaths because he knew it made him look bad, which is a pretty, because he wanted to sell more books. It was a pretty, uh, pretty bad thing to do. And so we'll see him answer questions uh, about that at this committee hearing. More rising right after this. Brazilian government and Elon Musk have been in a feud. It began when a Brazilian judge, Alexandra de Morales, ordered regulators to ban access to the social media platform X after Musk refused to appoint a legal representative in the country. But the feud didn't stop there. Brazil then said if X didn't comply, it would block Starlink, the Musk-owned satellite company. This is a crucial tool for tens of thousands of Brazilians in remote areas in the Amazon rainforest. Starlink said it would not comply with a nationwide ban on X, calling it illegal. But now the satellite provider has reversed course and agreed to block billionaire Musk's media site X in the Latin American nation. Author and journalist Michael Schellenberger is here with us to discuss what's happening in Brazil. We're also going to talk about Germany, where the far right has won a state election for the first time since 1945. Michael, always great to have you on, and I know you're paying close attention to the situation in Brazil. Uh, you know, you cover um, threats to free speech, particularly free speech online in a variety of other countries. What is the situation in Brazil? Hey, thanks for having me on, Robbie. Um, it's a bad situation. I mean, I'm sort of shocking for me. I lived there 30 years ago as a you know when I was in college. I love the country. I love the people. You know, it was a country that had a very progressive constitution. It fought against a military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985. The truth is that Brazil's now a dictatorship. I mean, it, that may sound like hyperbole, but the fact of the matter is, you basically have two people. President Lula and the Supreme Court Justice Alexandre de Moraes, who are making up laws as they go along. They're arbitrarily enforcing laws. They're persecuting their political enemies. They just banned acts. I mean, they now join China, Iran, North Korea as countries that have fully banned the social media platform. It's a I mean, I personally, because I did the Twitter files Brazil, I'm under criminal investigation in Brazil and the attorney general of Brazil has recommended that the Supreme Court prosecute me. It's not going to stop me from flying down there tomorrow, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a shocking turn of events that uh, Brazil's a, a very important country. It's the sixth largest country by size. And it's worth noting that the tactics that they've been using have been endorsed by Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, both the censorship of election information that they disapprove of, the deplatforming of their political opponents, and then cross-platform bans, meaning that the Brazilian government, when they want to ban somebody, they demand that they be banned from every social media platform, which is basically career death for politicians and journalists, all of us who make our livings on social media. So it's an extremely, it's a very extreme and troubling situation. And I think it now turns to the public to rally in support of free speech and the restoration of democracy. 
What do you make of Lula's comments that the world isn't obliged to put up with billionaire Elon Musk's commentary or his social media site and the misinformation he pushes on it just because, you know, he is a billionaire and he's bought access to these people. Of course, the courts have found that misinformation and far right accounts, especially surrounding Brazil's elections, is the reason they deem the app not safe for people to use because they see it as being used as a tool to undermine democracy by Elon Musk, who himself said, we will coup whoever we want in reference to Bolivia. Um, well, I'm not sure about that last quote. I don't know the context of it. But I mean, the great thing about uh, social media platforms is that you can block people that you don't like. So the Supreme Court Justice and the president of Brazil are can easily block Elon Musk. They don't have to listen to Elon Musk. What is a violation of free speech is deciding that other people can't listen to Elon Musk um, and block him. I don't really think that uh, the the net worth of somebody really matters to you know their free speech rights. X happens to be owned by Elon Musk. There's a new story out today in the New York Times of Brazil, which is the Folia of Sao Paulo, where they report that Marais sought to crack down on X in spring of 2023 uh, just because Elon Musk had bought it. So another case of arbitrary enforcement. The other thing that many people have pointed out is that the technical reason for banning X is because it had no legal representation in Brazil. And that's because they the X closed its Brazil office, fearing that its staff would be arrested. Well, when the president Lula announced that he was leaving X for other social media platforms, the top social media platform he named was Blue Sky. Well, Blue Sky has no legal representation in Brazil either. So you're seeing arbitrary and selective enforcement of the laws. It's important to remember that the Brazilian constitution has a specifically very strong statement in support of free speech for social political issues. It's true that there's more caveats to speech in Brazil than there are in the United States. But on the issue of political speech, it's they have equally strong protections. And, and again, you know, free speech, like in Brazil, like everywhere else in the world, has traditionally been the the demand of the left, including of President Lula at, when he fought against the dictatorship in the 1970s and 80s, they were fighting censorship. So to see, you know, leftists, ostensibly leftists and liberals demanding censorship, it's quite a shock. It's very disappointing. I think it's important to point out, too, that even moderate voices in Brazil, including uh, many people in, in the media that had been calling for more censorship, they themselves recognize that this is an extreme act and um, and really is a clear violation of the law and of the Constitution. And always ends up putting the social media companies, uh, even ones that are not run by Elon Musk, in the difficult position of deciding, well, you know, how much do we want to comply? Do we want to then not provide our service because we can only provide it under circumstances that we think are morally wrong, but is that better or worse for the people, you know, the decision whether to take down Starlick, for instance, something that the people, uh, I mean, people all over the world um, rely on for their for their livelihoods. You know, do we, should we compromise to make that available there? You know, these are decisions that Google has had to make with respect to China. Other social media companies have had to make with respect to uh, the Middle East. Um, and, and right now, many social media companies are going to have to make with respect to Europe as EU bureaucrats uh, increasingly sound like they want to assert the right to determine, again, what is misinformation, what is hate speech, what is all of that. You know, what is your advice, not specifically even to Elon, but just to the heads of social media companies? We heard from Mark Zuckerberg recently that he regrets going along with what the U.S. government told him to do during COVID, and that if that happened again, he indicated he would be a lot more um, skeptical of, the, of the, the soft pressure, you know, not the direct, it wasn't direct orders, but soft pressure that did have an effect on, on moderation. You know, what do you think the heads of social media companies, how should they respond to these kinds of things? You know, it's such a hard question, honestly. And I, 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 I don't really feel like I can say what I would do if I were, you know, a multi-billionaire head of a social <laughs> media company. I really feel like it would be sort of disingenuous. And I don't provide advice to social media, you know, platform heads. What I will say, though, is that um, there are ways around these bans. Uh, this VPNs, which uh, you know, podcasters and others have been advertising for years. You never quite knew why you needed one. Uh, now you really need one in Brazil. It allows you to get around the ban. Of course, it's illegal to access X using a VPN. 
you know, the problem, of course, is that even if like Europe were to shut down X and the whole world, let's say, shut down X, except for maybe the United States, it, it's, the social media companies have no way to accept advertising at that point because it would be illegal to advertise on X. But nonetheless, I mean, I mean, what's really no one's really talked about here, which is very interesting, is that, you know, Starlink, which is this Elon's, you know, Elon Musk's satellite Internet company combined with X basically allows would allow for a free speech platform to potentially evade governments. Now, of course, they could try to, you know, freeze Elon's at Elon Musk's assets in the United States or or in Europe or somewhere else. I mean, that was shocking. You know, they they froze the bank accounts of Starlink in Brazil, even though Starlink is a separate company from X in Brazil. As you mentioned in the opening monologue, you know, Starlink today just announced that it was going to block X, the social media platform that Elon owns. So it's a it's a really strange you know environment. I mean, one I would just observe that like the power of the state, you know, and the power of states working together to engage in censorship was so powerful that they were able to force one of the richest men in the world, Mark Zuckerberg, to engage in unconscionable censorship on COVID, which he apologized for, and on the Hunter Biden laptop, which he apologized for. Apparently, only Elon Musk level of wealth. Over two hundred billion dollars is enough to allow you to stand up to the state, but I think even that has limits. So I think we're in a very dynamic environment. Um, obviously, we all want, you know, all of us that love free speech want Musk to stand strong. But at the end of the day, I do think you still need a free speech movement to be out in the streets and you know on the airwaves and online demanding free speech because I just think it's too much pressure on. A single individual or company to bear. And before we, Michael, I think it's important we be specific about what we're talking about here. The judge's order that was released on Friday does not say anything about you know we need to end the free speech that's had on X. Actually, they're criticizing X for not being a platform of free speech by quote keeping voters away from real and accurate information. They have found that X pushed disinformation about the results of the recent Democrat elect election that elected Lula, a, a democratic socialist, to public office. Uh, and so by pushing this information to the people, Elon Musk was not a bastion of free speech. He was actually pushing false information to people and depriving their access to the truth. And so this is someone who has a track record of supporting this kind of Latin American intervention that's been done by the United States for many years in response to this accusation that the U US government had organized a coup recently against Evo Morales in Bolivia in order for Tesla to secure the lithium there, Musk tweeted in response to this, we will coup whoever we want, deal with it. So I think you know to call the banning of X to end free speech would be like saying if we were to shoot down a CIA spy plane, throwing propaganda out of its windows for people to receive the pamphlets, that that would be anti-free speech. If that's how you see free speech, fine. But I really see this as an effort to ensure that access to information in the country is not the equivalent of ensuring U.S.-backed coups across Latin America. But but Elon, but Jessica, Elon isn't the U.S. government. He's creating a platform where you can get information, and you can disagree with the information, but like, or you can call it propaganda, and I don't know that I agree with that characterization, but propaganda is speech as well. The the government is, of Brazil is, is the ones trying to say that which information can be available on the platform. Like Elon Musk in his personal capacity as a, as a user of X, pushing information. I mean, he's just, in, the pushing the information is the engaging in free speech that the government is trying to uh, to, to, to prevent. But I'll, I'll let you uh, field that one, Michael. Sure. I mean, I I, I'll, I'll, I haven't looked into the, the Bolivia statements. That's very interesting. But yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, Elon uh, Musk bought X after, or it came, I mean, I think he took control of it after the Brazil election. So to the extent to which there was misinformation on X during the Brazilian elections. I don't really think you can blame Elon for that. I, you know, and again, it is a platform. I mean, I personally have been seeing a lot of posts supporting the censorship in Brazil go viral on X. And the it's worth pointing out that the Brazilian government, the Workers' Party, which is the president's ruling party, um, and the opposition, you know, journalists and people advocate, they're all still on X. So people are openly violating the laws and they're going viral. So I think if there were some uh, if there were some of that censorship going on, we would be we would not be seeing those posts go viral. I mean, it's quite shocking. I mean, you may have seen Mark Ruffalo, Keith Ellison, uh, 
you know, uh, Robert Reich, they've all been supporting Brazil and urging more censorship and it's all happening on X. So I just think everybody, uh, you know, I, I think that the, we just need to get back to this idea that, you know, we need to we need to only have censorship for things that are clearly illegal, like child exploitation and immediate incitement to violence and and just get used to i mean get used to having social media platforms that allow uh for freedom of speech and for yeah i mean one person's propaganda is a another person's you know honest journalism so i think that where we where we where we landed on this issue in 1789 in the united states with the first amendment is still the right approach and and brazil is close to having that in the constitution but um, there's enough wiggle room there and there's enough endemic corruption that uh, they've become one of the first com- the first countries in the world to to go down this totalitarian path. Hmm. I got to leave yeah, it there. I would just say, you know, to say that, well, we see posts from Keith Ellison and others, that would be like saying we don't have climate change because we experience many cold days. Uh, we clearly see what's happening in X is, is some disinformation around Lula ahead of the October elections in Brazil. And so this is someone who would prefer as many US ba- backed coups were in the past, backed by a major multinational corporation that has interests in the region. And so Elon Musk saying, well, coup whoever we want in reference to Bolivia, are we to believe his mindset has changed? Or are we to take him for his word and think that the reason he's pushing this misinformation is because he's unhappy with Wait, the leadership what are you, in Brazil? I, because what the leadership on earth in Brazil are you is saying? What are you the kind pushing of mis- exploitation and extraction of resources that we've seen from billionaires and very wealthy people based in the United States imposing their what views is the in Latin what is the Africa. be clear, Jessica? What is the misinformation that he's pushing here? He's been found by the judge in Brazil to be pushing and so the government is saying what he is saying is, is misinformation. About the That's elections. the judge's and opinion, not allowing. And what we are saying is that he should be allowed. No, don't quick. interrupt me. Don't you can interrupt talk me. Over me, Robbie. But it doesn't saying, make you more. What right. you're saying makes no sense. What we are saying is that my, what my belief is I'm talking about is that he should be allowed ruling, to say Robbie. something, and you get to criticize him. What the judge is saying is that he doesn't get to say that. The judge is saying that you cannot deprive the users of an app where they get news and information of the truth and and make the algorithm be one that does not show that to the people in Brazil and force the Brazilian people when they log on to X to see much more information that is inaccurate about the election to push a billionaire's political agenda in another country. But That's Jessica, what this I ruling mean, is you, about. First of all, the judge demanded that X ban politicians and journalists permanently, including, I'll give you one example, a politician post, it was accused of election misinformation by the by the judge, Morais, for posting something about labor issues the day after the elections. And the judge said, ban him anyway. All this is occurring in secret. Um, X decided it didn't want to carry out those demands. They said that these are unconstitutional, illegal demands. Just go look at the Alexandre files which is a new X account to see the details of these cases. But the, what, I mean, what you're, I mean, I'm not sure if you know what you're defending, but you're, what they're demanding is that people be banned permanently from the platform. Now, in the case of election information, I had this conversation in Brazil. It's very important to understand. The idea that you should, that the government should be able to ban disfavored election information, election information that it disagrees with, and the name that that's election misinformation. How would you ever know if the government stole the elections? If there's government corruption of elections, you precisely need free speech in order to expose it. And this is not a left, I should hasten to add, it's not a left right thing. I mean, be very careful what you wish for when you demand censorship, because it could end up redounding against the causes that you care about. We certainly saw that on pro-Palestinian protests over recent months in the United States. You know, the left has historically been demanding free speech when it's been on the side of marginalized groups, now that the left has power, it's demanding censorship. And I, I think that I think we'll all look back on this. And, and and as Robert F. Kennedy famously says, you know, you look back at history and the good guys are never the ones demanding censorship. I, I definitely think that's the case here in Brazil. Yeah, I look at this as a, a pattern of behavior on behalf of large multinational corporations like X. Uh, we can look at the, the coup in, in Ecuador. And we see that the Dulles brothers, who were formerly lawyers with Sullivan and Cromwell, who represented United Fruit Company, 
Then they came into office in the State Department and they orchestrated a coup. They made it seem like there was civil unrest in the country through the spread of propaganda, casting doubt as to whether or not the democratically elected leader that questioned the land ownership of United Fruit Company. They owned a significant swath of the arable land there. They said, it's not okay that you're exploiting our labor and owning all of our land for what? For profit back home in the United States? This is our land and it should be used by the people of Ecuador and for our benefit. And by saying that, he got the attention of the U.S. State Department because they were in cahoots with these guys who are lawyers representing multinational corporations like United Fruit Company, who was one of their clients. And so this idea that we should believe Elon Musk, a billionaire who has received billions of dollars of government subsidies, who has a close relationship with the Pentagon through his work with SpaceX, that he just has a benevolent intention for his work in Latin America and pushing this information. So I think the Brazilians have a right to have media companies that are based within their country's borders. I don't think very rich guys all around the world should have the right to impose their beliefs on people in other but countries. It's not but the Jessica, right. you can, first of all, you can mute Elon. And if, in terms of the CIA- But the point uh, is he and, owns the app, Michael. He runs the algorithm. But you're not, but you can, you, you're not, you're not obliged to even follow any of the posts on the For You recommendation page. You can just follow your own people. And Jessica, if you're concerned about U.S. government involvement, the U.S. government, through AID and the National Endowment of Democracy, has been funding the groups demanding censorship in Brazil. So if your concern is U.S. imperialism, the imperialists in Brazil are on the side of censorship. They're on the side of the Lula government. Just go look at the National Endowment for Democracy's webpage on Brazil. It's grant after grant after grant to groups that are demanding censorship. So I, I went to Nicaragua when I was 17. I've been opposed to imperialism my entire life. That's why I went to Latin America and lived in Brazil. I'm against U.S. imperialism, and that's why you should be against uh, censorship in Brazil. Censorship is never the tool of the good guys. Anybody that wants to censor their opponents, is they want to do so for power. Censorship is never about the truth. It's always about power. Um, so I share your concern about U.S. imperialism, and that's why I'm for free speech. So if Elon Musk wasn't preventing access to the articles about the election that were considered the truth, I would maybe understand that. If this was a platform where all of the information was accessible, I would get that this is a free speech concern, but I don't see the National Endowment for Democracy and USAID as more of an arm of U.S. imperialism than I see America's largest multinational corporations, to which Elon Musk is the head of. But Jessica, the Brazilian government is the one demanding the takedown of content. Like that is, if your problem is content not being available, it is the Brazilian government saying these accounts and this content can't be on the platform. Like that is that is the obvious. No, they're but asking they are. for balanced content. They're asking for the information. But that's not about free speech. The, election that is the false government to not deciding be what is and balanced and what should be on the platform is not free speech. In an algorithm. But Jessica, no, but there's no no one's even alleged that Elon Musk is censoring disfavored information. Yes, they have. That's what was in the judge's original ruling released Friday, Michael. The 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 ruling, I mean, there, what was the evidence that he cited that there was something that Elon Musk had censored? The the court documents about what precisely has been censored is not there. What he said in his statement, quote, you can't say that to the effect of he's taking things down or not. The judge wrote in his original ruling that Elon Musk on X had allowed the massive spread of disinformation, hate speech and attacks on the democratic rule of law. Yeah, right. had allowed information. That is the anger. Voters away from real and accurate information. Right. He is not well, accused not, of taking down information. He's accused of allowing information the government doesn't want on the site. That is the crime. If he ensures that the only information that is seen is information of the far right and that is false, but and ensures not. that the information is disfavored, that, that, that is your true, misunderstanding that has the of what's going on you here. Scroll on your feed, Robbie. Jessica, he's li there's literally no one has presented any evidence and the judge hasn't even presented any evidence of Elon Musk censoring information. What you were describing just then is a rhetorical flourish where he's suggesting that somehow there's there's more right wing content and that somehow is preventing people from seeing the content that he likes. But literally in all of the record here and all of the complaints, the whole legal history, go read my Twitter files, which went through years of this. The demands are to ban people, to censor information. 
it's not a demand that that X stops censoring people. So I think you've got it a little twisted, and I encourage you to go back well, and read the Twitter no, files. No, what's happened here is they demanded that there be a, a court-ordered legal representative of X in Brazil, that they go over how the website runs to ensure that it is not favoring false information over true information, and Elon Musk was unwilling to do that. So they said, okay, if you're unwilling to have a fair app where access to information is not biased, then you can't have X operate in Brazil. This idea that this all boils down to the judge's word, word versus Elon Musk's word is a, is a false accounting of what's going on here. Now, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that the record is very clear that the, the judge has repeatedly demanded that people be banned and censored. He has presented no, he's not even said that, that X has censored people. He's saying that they haven't censored people at all and they need to censor them. And that's been the whole, and ban them. And, and that they'd be banned across all social media platforms. So this idea that the government's going to work with the social media platform to be fair, that's that's just doublespeak for censorship. All right, yeah, we I don't leave see it, it as censorship. I don't um, think people have a right or, or people should be required to use Elon Musk's app or see his view of the world. Well, they, they're not required to. They could just log off. The, the government is the one doing the requiring, Jessica. It's like people, we've gone wrong. We've gone around on this. So many times now, Michael, we appreciate you uh, sticking it out for an extra long conversation on this subject. Hope to see you again. Thanks, Thanks so for much. having me. I spy with my little eye. Well, a former aide to New York Governor Kathy Hochul has been arrested and charged with acting as an agent for the Chinese government. Linda Sun, who also worked for former Governor Andrew Cuomo, was charged with violating and conspiring to violate the Foreign Agents Registrations Act visa fraud, alien smuggling, and money laundering conspiracy, according to an unsealed copy of the indictment. According to the 65-page indictment, prosecutors say Sun used her role in government to quietly push China's agenda, like blocking then-governor the then governor Andrew Cuomo, excuse me, from meeting Taiwanese officials. In exchange, Sun received millions of dollars and as benefits as well, including Nanjing-style salted duck, lavish cars like a 2024 Ferrari. Incredible. Now, Chris Hugh, her husband, was also arrested Tuesday on charges of money laundering conspiracy and conspiracy to commit bank fraud, as well as misusing means of identification. Sun and Hu had pleaded not guilty, allegedly. The pair's actions gave China influence in New York's government for a decade. They were released on bond. Now, the discovery process is a part of the Justice Department's effort to root out secret Chinese agents in the United States. Sun, who is originally from China, has worked in state government for years, and she was fired in 2023 for misconduct. So, Robbie, it turns out she had no direct in, uh, interactions with Governor Cuomo, according to reporting by ABC News. Had to look into that as, you know, his controversy is dug back up as he testifies before this congressional committee. But just a, a bit of a crazy story to use her position in government in New York um, to change New York state officers messaging about China whatever that means, uh, and arrange meetings for visiting delegations from the PRC government with New York state government officials. Uh, it's, it's most likely stuff that has to do with Chinese businesses operating in New York. That's my inclination, but not totally sure. Yeah, this is really bad, though, and really obvious. Um, so she was trying to just, she just made it more difficult for New York governing officials to meet with Taiwanese officials, like you can picture her like shoving the, the Taiwanese out the door um, in exchange for just obvious for bribes, for, you know, corruption, for, for money, for a, a for, they bought her a Ferrari. They sent her, her the salted duck she likes to eat. Um, this is pretty, you know, nakedly, obviously corrupt practices. This is, you know, calling to mind, um, uh, um, uh, what's his face? Gold the, bars. Uh, yeah, the gold bars. Uh, the uh, Menendez, the uh, uh, New Jersey senator, you know, having uh, having gold what stuffed in his his wife's high heels or something like that. It was in the, I think I I, I recall it being shoe related, something like that. Um, this is uh, so this is very bad. <laughs> Obviously, she deserves due process, and they have to build the case and make the case. Um, but it sounds uh, really awful to just have an outright 
Chinese spy plant in your in, in the governor's office at a high level of decision making. Maybe not a high level decision making under Cuomo, but it sounds like a very high level decision making under Kathy Hochul um, in order to thwart the ability of Taiwanese officials to talk to the governor. Uh, this is some crazy criminal stuff. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a concern. It goes to show the, the levels of influence the Chinese, uh, China's authoritarian government is attempting to have over, our, uh, over policy here um, in, in the U.S. And I would note, actually, we haven't dug into this very much, that um, Tim Walls, Kamala Harris's choice for VP, is very, very, very China-friendly, has visited China numerous times, has ties to the Chinese government, and that, you know, that is, might be something to be, for voters to be concerned about if they are worried about the level of influence um, China's awful, repressive government has um, here at home. Yeah, I will say it's very interesting. I studied public affairs at Brown University. We had a large amount of students that came from China to study the intricacies of American government. And this is something that's generally regarded as good, right? It strengthens U.S.-China relations. Uh, I can see a lot of these American, America First folks criticizing this, saying, well, why do they need to know this? Is this good information to be giving you know, foreigners? Should there be some restrictions on what people can come and study? Because you also have a lot of ex-State Department officials, people at the highest level of government who come and lecture to the students at these programs share what's happened under the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. And it seems to be a lot of information to be giving to students who come to the US for four years, study and go back home. A lot of them, yeah, I still keep in touch with, and a lot of them are business executives. Some of them end up working you know, for the government there in China. And it's just fascinating that they come to the United States and spend you know, years studying U.S. politics, but also the intricacies of U.S. government. And so I think things like this are going to be more frequent. But as President Xi just said, is speaking recently, that this idea that the U.S. needs to compete with China, rather than see these two countries as incredibly large, powerful economies that the citizens of either country would benefit if they decided to cooperate and work together rather than always see each other as enemies, of course, this sounds like the type of business dealing where it was oligarchs that were that were dealing with Sun there in New York. That's not the kind of partnership I think we need. But I do think something needs to change about the U.S.-China relationship. I don't think this is going to be a step in the right direction for a lot of the people that are very skeptical of what the U.S.-China relationship could look like in a world of competition continuing, which is seemingly what the United States wants. I have a proposed solution to the, the problem you just presented, the Chinese students okay. coming here and, and learning, uh, being educated in the U.S. And, you know, is this a national security risk? Because then they go back to China and they use what they've learned here to maybe help make more powerful and more vast the Chinese government. I have the answer. We should just not send them back. I don't understand this policy <laughs> whatsoever. I am for <laughs> bringing, them, bringing them here to get educated, but then under the, the US policy of, of how we handle these, these immigrants is th when their education is done, they go back to China. No, they should stay here. They should use the knowledge that they've acquired in our schools to help improve this country and, and have better lives. It's a mutual beneficial exchange. We don't need to ship them, them back to China. It makes absolutely no sense. It is the stupidest policy I have ever come across, but that is the policy to return these students to China uh, where they could very well end up uh, working for um, the government. They might have no choice but to serve uh, the authoritarian government's interests there. So that is a bad policy and we should not do it. I don't understand it at all. It seems like- But what if they stay here, ones. Robbie, and then they do what Sun did in, yeah. <laughs> in government in the United States? Are you sure you want them all to stay? I don't well, know. I think any, I, like people in the US go and study in Europe, but I think it's different when it's like, unfriendly governments sending yeah. their students across borders. Well, look, we should vet them. And if there's some reason to think they're Communist Party plants, then we don't have to take them or educate them here. But once they're here and we're educating, they should stay here and not be sent. I mean, they're more likely to become doing work for the government if they go back there. And then, yes, they should be 
investigated if they, I mean, this is, this is some pretty obvious corruption, by the way. I can't believe it took this long to figure out that, like, where did her Ferrari come from? Where did all this money come from? Um, a more, uh, a more uh, uh, um, robust, uh, what would the, you know, this police state watching us all the time seems to miss the obvious spies in our midst um, as they're busy, I don't know, going through our luggage at the airport. I don't know, maybe they can get on some more serious mm. um, crimes every now and then. I would like to believe that the education required to get anything done in American government is the kind of education that you could go on to get anything done just about anywhere because it is so incredibly difficult to get anything done in American government and that's why this degree is something that these students want. It could have nothing to do with wanting inside information on the US government. I feel it's important to say that and that I got in on scholarship and a lot of these foreign students, I'm sure all of them uh, pay full tuition. And so is it possible that Americans get a good education, especially working class ones on this without the Chinese students making up half of the student body to keep the program going with the money they're bringing in for the school? Like, are we that dependent on China, Robbie? Maybe. No one talks about this kind of trade deficit. Mm. We should try, next time you're in the studio, let's get some salted duck. Let's, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's try it. I'm, I'm I'll make now. some calls, Robbie. Yeah, all right. <laughs> That sounds like a plan. More rising right after this. <laughs> Donald Trump is promising to release the Jeffrey Epstein client list. The former president joined Lex Friedman on his popular podcast on Monday, where Trump said that if reelected, he would have, quote, no problem releasing more files relating to convicted sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. Let's take a listen. The list of clients that went to the island has not been made public. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? Probably will be, by the way. Probably. So if you're able to, you'll be... Yeah, I'd certainly take a look at it. Now, Kennedy's interesting because it's so many years ago. You know, they do that for danger, too, because, you know, it endangers certain people, et cetera, et cetera. So Kennedy uh, is very different from the Epstein thing. But, yeah, I'd be inclined to do the Epstein. I'd have no problem with it. Now, a list of names of people who visited Epstein's Island, including Trump, was released in January when a New York judge unsealed court documents. Prince Andrew, former U.S. President Bill Clinton, were among the public figures on the list, too. But Trump denies ever going. Let's watch. There's a moment where you had some hesitation about Epstein, releasing some of the documents on Epstein. Why the hesitation? I don't think I had, I mean, I'm not involved. I never went to his island, um, fortunately. Now, regardless, if he frequented Epstein's island, he didn't release any related material when he was in the White House. Pollster Frank Luntz pointed this out, posting on X, quote, Jeffrey Epstein died in August 2019, and Trump did not release any Epstein files in the remaining 17 months of his presidency. He's also got Epstein's old jet. And I know that when old people die, Robbie, it doesn't mean that much that their jet ends up in someone else's hands. Rich people buy things. There's probably not a, a huge number of private jets. But interesting that now Jeffrey Epstein's jet has Trump 2024 painted on it. Mm. And Trump has been taking it around on the campaign trail. Very interesting. Well, a lot of people have been wondering for years now why we cannot just see this client list. Why? Is it because powerful people in our government or in private industry don't want you to know that they were at least attempted to be involved, that Jeffrey Epstein had tried to rope them into his sexual abuse of minors, had tried to, you know, he was running some kind of blackmailing operation to have power over these people in terms of inviting them on his plane, inviting them to his island, um, putting them into compromising situations, not to say that Everyone involved in that was just like some innocent victim or had no idea. You ought to have known, especially after he had already been convicted and put away for sexual abuse of minors. This is something that already happened. And then Jeffrey Epstein was able to re reinsert himself into polite society to still have a positive relationship with Bill Gates, with uh, with financial institutions, with um, universities, at, with 
political figures and to go about continuing to abuse minors until he was again arrested and then obviously uh, allegedly killed himself or did die. It's not alleged that he died. He's dead. But how it happened is, of course, some matter of dispute uh, in prison. Uh, but yeah, we want to know. Uh, we want to know what is being covered up and why can't it just be revealed who else was involved? Yeah, I think the New York judge that ended up unsealing these court documents was like, there's no reason there should they should have been sealed in the first place, which I think speaks to your exact point. This is powerful people trying to protect themselves against what public scrutiny, criminal charges. The fact that there's a list of very powerful people that we still don't have access to, even after a judge said there's no reason this should have been sealed in the first place is ridiculous. And I think there's a reason Donald Trump doesn't say, yes, absolutely, I would release the Epstein files. Instead, he says, I'll take a look at it. And he he deflects the question onto talking about Kennedy. I think there's a reason Donald Trump doesn't want those files released, because we've seen the photos of him and his wife partying with Ghislaine Maxwell and partying with Jeffrey Epstein. They were buddies. I'm sure people that are implicated on those lists are his friends if he's not on those lists himself. So I am very doubtful that Trump, when had the opportunity as president to make these documents public, will make them president or will make them public if he becomes president in, in 2024 or rather 2025. I don't think that's going to be one of the first things he does once he gets in office, nor do I think we can expect it within his four year term. Yeah, I, I think you could say it's clearly not a priority of his. It didn't happen when he was president. It could have happened. Of course, it also hasn't happened under the Biden administration. Um, you know, whether Trump will be more motivated to enact policies or accomplish things that so many of his supporters want him to accomplish next time around is an open question. Um, uh, this is one of them. Obviously, there's significant interest in having Epstein's vast web of of corruption and sexual abuse exposed and the people involved held accountable. And the frustrating thing is that which, whichever party wins, it seems there's very little interest in doing so or of explaining how this came to be, how he continued to have sway over the Virgin Islands um, with Bill Gates, with Harvard, and, and yes, an association going back a long ways with Trump with the Clintons um, and and what came of that. That's uh, something the American people want answered. And unfortunately, they can't necessarily properly trust the political system to d deliver them some uh, to, to get to the bottom of it. Right. And yeah, Clinton, of course, had his day in the sun as a, a weird dude, a creepy dude, maybe. Um, I think that maybe. no one was surprised. <laughs> Certainly. I yeah, would say. maybe. <laughs> More than um, maybe. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think Prince Andrew and the royal family, that was a bit more of a scandal when we saw his name on these documents because people were aware of this sort of hush money case where he, he paid her to go away. That's what wealthy people do. Uh, they say, all right, how about instead of continuing on and bringing these charges against me and having our day in court, I just give you a bunch of money and that'll make this all better. Of course, people want to know if a public figure has been accused of something like this and what they've done. And so I think it's uh, it gave me a strong sense of justice back in January when we saw, you know, Prince Andrew implicated for what he did, because I think just people have a right to know. And so often you have these these terrible things go away because someone's paid off. And I think the people have a right to know. And I think no one should be above the law. No one should be able to buy their way out of being accountable for something bad they did. And so at a time when the royal family was ostracizing Meghan and Harry, why were they not ostracizing Prince Andrew? Why was he one of the darling of, darlings of the royal family? But what, Meghan Markle is a criminal because she's Black and American? Just what happened in that family during, you know, recent years is really sad to me. And it speaks to their priorities. And I think, you know, the Jeffrey Epstein scandal is just one of the many nails in the coffin of the royal family's respect in the world. But I think people want to know what the flight logs look like. And there's all kinds of documents, you know, circling on the web saying, these are the official documents, these are the official documents. And a lot of them are not what was in the court documents. I think people need once and for all everything we've got on the Epstein case. No pseudonym, pseudonyms call people by their actual names. There's no reason any of this should have been sealed. 
And there's no reason more charges uh, weren't brought against these folks. Why were there not more investigations done? We've just still got more questions than answers. More rising right after this. The Justice Department has announced criminal charges against Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar and several other senior militants in connection with the October 7th attack on Israel. Now, the charges accuse the Hamas leaders of financing and directing a decades-long campaign to murder American citizens and endanger the security of the United States. Attorney General Merrick Garland said these charges would not be the last. Take a listen. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists murdered nearly 1,200 people, including over 40 Americans, and kidnapped hundreds of civilians. They perpetrated the deadliest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. This weekend, we learned that Hamas murdered six more hostages, including Hirsch Goldberg Poland, a 23-year-old Israeli American. We are investigating Hirsch's murder and each and every one of the brutal murders of Americans as acts of terrorism. We will continue to support the whole of government effort to bring the Americans still being held hostage home. The charges unsealed today are just one part of our effort to target every aspect of Hamas's operations. These actions will not be our last. The seven-count criminal complaint filed in federal court in New York City includes charges of conspiracy to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization, conspiracy to murder U.S. nationals, and conspiracy to use weapons of mass destruction resulting in death. It also accuses Iran and Hezbollah of providing financial support and military supplies to Hamas for use in attacks. Three of the six defendants are dead, and Sinwar is believed to be hiding in the tunnels in Gaza. Now, with the U.S. pressing charges against Hamas, what does this do for efforts to get both sides to the bargaining table for an enduring ceasefire? Can the U.S. possibly be seen as a realistic mediator between Hamas and Israel? Here to discuss all of this is The Hill's White House columnist, Niall Stanage. Niall, welcome back. Good to be with you. So does this change anything in terms of the U.S.'s role in trying to get a ceasefire deal um, in Gaza, at, you know, at the same time, we, what, we seek to arrest the leaders of Hamas, including the architect uh, Yahya Sinwar of October 7th. Uh, Israel's goal is to capture or kill um, all these people. How, does that, how can that be squared with the idea of having some lasting peace between Israel and the terrorist organization, Hamas? So on one hand, I think the unsealing of this indictment is really a response to the demand for the United States government to to do something after the shooting dead of those six hostages, including, as uh, the Attorney General mentioned, an, an Israeli-American citizen, Hirsch Goldberg Pollen. I'm not sure how much it affects the calculus in terms of the peace talks, because, I, I mean, the Hamas for its part, does not consider the United States government to be some neutral arbiter in this matter. Uh, Hamas, and indeed the Palestinian people more broadly, would of course see the US government as already very strongly on the Israeli side in the overarching conflict. Just one other thing, Robbie, that I think is worth mentioning. Apparently, this indictment was actually made under seal some months ago and has only been unsealed recently, uh, partly because security concerns are perceived to have lessened, but also because, as you noted in your introduction, three of the six people in this indictment are thought to be dead. Now, what does this all mean for the United States? I mean, charging these folks who are overseas... Uh, at, at a time when these Americans that were killed by Hamas on October 7th, this is now months later, is there a strategic decision being made to unseal this now as the United States has sent warships to the Middle East? Is this a part of the United States justifying potentially greater involvement, uh, potentially on the ground in, in Palestine, in Israel, in the region? I think there are a couple of ways of, of looking at that, Jessica. On one hand, I see the unsealing of the indictment as honestly a bit more of a public relations move than anything else. I mean, nobody realistically expects Yaya Sinwar to be caught alive if he's caught at all, and certainly not a sort of extradited to face charges in the United States. I don't think that is realistically going to happen. 
Now, as far as the you know American involvement, I mean, it is true, of course, that uh, Americans were among those killed both on October seventh and more recently in the killing of Mr. Goldberg Pollen. It is understandable that the United States government would be expected to take some kind of action in relation to that. I, I would note in passing that there have also been Palestinian American citizens killed. Uh, there was a young man uh, killed in the West Bank, presumably by Israeli forces, and there has been notably less um, vocal outrage from the United States government about that. So th that is part of the asymmetry, I think, that has uh, bedeviled the uh, White House response to this conflict. But that's where we are, and, and that's part of the reason why I think these indictments have been unsealed. Yeah, you, you say it's, you know, some response. I mean, it has to look like the U.S. is doing something, right? There won't actually be implications for this. There won't be some kind of change in policy. You know, there will not be ground forces sent to arrest Sinwar over this. So this really is just to give the appearance that, oh, yes, we condemn this, and we would, in some ideal world, hold... Um, these people responsible for the crimes, the murders of American citizens. Yes, to me, that's exactly what it is, Robbie. I think it is really an attempt to say, well, look, you can't be responsible for the death or the murder of American citizens and expect there to be no sanction for that, even on a theoretical basis. You know, this is all about saying there would, as you put it, in an, in an ideal world, be consequences for this and there would be consequences that would play out in the criminal justice system. Uh, and the idea that the Department of Justice is in some fashion um, levying pressure by doing this. Now, for Yaya Sinwar, who has spent, as far as we know, many months underground in the tunnels underneath Gaza, frankly, I'm not too sure whether a Department of Justice indictment makes much difference one way or another. He has um, more immediate threats to his life to be concerned about. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's primarily a symbolic move. So on August 9th, the United States sent $3.5 billion additional dollars worth of weapons to Israel. This is in violation of the conventional arms transfer policy, which says that the United States will not transfer weapons to known human rights violators. That, of course, makes the United States kind of look like a hypocrite to the international community, right? To violate the law to send additional weapons to Israel then to decide to prosecute, you know, the the members of Hamas that have been responsible for killing American citizens, but not the members of the IDF responsible for doing the same. How does how does all of this and the use of the justice system now, you know, to prosecute members of Hamas while we're violating our own laws to transfer these weapons? How does this case, these charges look on the international stage, do you think? Well, I think in the inter on the international stage, excuse me, the broad perception is that the United States is clearly the main and sometimes almost the sole ally of Israel and has underwritten from a, a diplomatic and political and military uh, perspective the assault on Gaza that's estimated to have killed about 40,000 people. On the point that you raise about breaching American laws and the kind of conditions that are applicable to, or at least theoretically applicable to American administrations. Um, a story that I don't think got enough attention, Jessica, was the issuance of a State Department report a few months back, which seemed to go to incredibly, in my view, convoluted ends to try to find a way to justify continuing the military support for Israel. Uh, it really it basically said, and I, I can't recall the precise quote, but it was something to the effect of, it is reasonable to assume that there may have been human rights violations by Israeli forces, but we can't say that on a, in a cut and dried uh, way about any individual one, so we'll keep going on. That report was really one of the markers on this road which has led yeah. The Biden administration to, in my opinion, a very morally uh, tough to defend position. Hmm. Great analysis, Niall. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
He's back. CNN has done a 180 and is returning to the chair, an anchor they once threw out, Brian Stelter. Stelter's previously the host of CNN's media show, Reliable Sources, and was also the lead author of the Reliable Sources newsletter. After nearly a decade, Stelter got fired in August of 2022 when CNN's then-network boss, Chris Licht, canceled his show on the grounds that it was biased. Media reporter Oliver Darcy took over handling the newsletter. Stelter then went on to freelance for a variety of outlets and even wrote a book. But last month, Darcy announced he was leaving CNN to start his own independent media newsletter. And surprise, surprise, Stelter is going to return to CNN as a chief media analyst, lead writer of the Reliable Sources newsletter. He's not getting the show back, but his announcement suggests, I think, that he will be appearing on camera to do media analysis, not having his own show, but appearing on other people's shows. The Twitterverse is having a ball with this news, as Brian Stelter was not a particularly popular character among the right. Tim Pool quoted actual photo of Brian Stelter just before CNN brought him back. Love the Loki reference there. Podcaster Jimmy Dore tweeted, quote, guess who won't be returning to CNN? The viewers. And several have shared part of this clip from Stelter back in 2020, questioning the Hunter Biden laptop story, or rather not questioning it. Let's watch. I, there's a lot about this story that does not add up. And the employee has not helped matters. He has contradicted himself in interviews with reporters. And, I mean, for all we know, these emails are made up, or maybe some are real and others are fakes. We don't know. But we do know that this is a classic example of the right-wing media machine. So Brian Stelter is back. And I should say, as much as he gets really, really trashed by the right, um, he did, I've been on CNN, the handful of times I've been on was uh, to be on his show. So at least appreciated a diversity of opinions enough to let little old Robbie uh, have a turn. Um, so I will always be grateful to that. And I've always gotten along with him. But uh, yes, the show became a kind of prime example of the liberal bias that um, so many conservatives, and frankly, people on the left as well, I think were not big fans of the show and how it just, everything was about the, the, the threat of Trump and, and very one-sided and never delving in too deeply and uh, just obsessed with the minutia of Trump says this, Trump says that. Um, that was what Brian Stelter was known for. So I don't know what this says about CNN's business decision making. They're thinking that he's being brought back. Uh, I was a little taken aback by this news yesterday. What do you make of it, Jessica? I don't know much about Stelter. I don't think he's someone that I've ever watched. I think young people increasingly get their news online and are not watching cable. So, um, you know, when he was fired, it was the first I'd heard of him. But the way he's put his new life change is uh, he uses video game language, which is always a signal to me that someone might be a little bit lonely. I don't know. Might be a, a little bit of a member of the incel community, if you will, to refer to life in terms of a video game. But nevertheless, he said, quote, I loved my old life as the anchor of a Sunday morning show. But to borrow some lingo from my video game blogger days, I finished that level of the game. Time for new levels, new challenges. So I don't know how you feel about my categorization of video game language, Robbie, but this is like a 39 year old man saying he's leveling up and he finished that level. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's a little weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a 36 year old man and uh, I did in fact spend last night um, playing video games by myself in my apartment. So I guess, uh, I guess I'm, uh, a fellow a fellow traveler of uh, Stelter in that way. I use video game language all the time to uh, to reference such things. But uh, but uh, yeah, so you know here we are uh, with I think CNN going back to um, to an old bringing back an old player in their midst. One kind of was wondering whether they got the idea that just relentlessly being obsessed with Trump. It was not delivering the viewers. They wanted to pivot in a different direction. But um, th this maybe signals that uh, maybe they expect a Trump presidency. I think this is a weird person to bring back in for a Kamala Harris presidency um, because his specialty is just is, is being obsessed with the foibles of the right and Trump's antics. I guess Trump, of course, will still be on the political scene uh, even if he loses. But uh, maybe this is an expectation that Trump is actually going to win. 
Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, to to have someone come back after firing them is, I think, a, a lens into what mainstream media is like, that they really don't have their finger on the pulse so much. They don't know what people really want to just fire someone and then bring them back some years later. I mean, we've seen so many hosts recycled before. Chris Cuomo, for one, who's on News Nation now, a lot of people talk about his firing and say, well, if it was your sibling and you were in that position, what would you do, right? And I think that's why people still watch Chris Cuomo and respect Chris Cuomo, because they kind of disagree with the reason for his firing in the first place, and they think he's a good news anchor. I think the maybe the media makes decisions too rapidly about to fi about firing personnel because at the end of the day, if they have an audience, if they have viewers, that's what you're paying for. And so, yeah, Chris Licht might have not personally liked the guy, but I think it was maybe a bad business decision because clearly he has a role in CNN somewhere. Chris Licht uh, obviously did not. Um survive uh, at uh, CNN either. Right. So the changes he made were not uh, uh, perceived to be moving things in the right direction whatsoever. So, you know, there's been so much chaos and turnover at CNN. Obviously they lost, they fired Don Lemon as well. I think that was under Chris Lick that mm -hmm. that happened. Um, same day mm -hmm. as, uh, as Tucker Carlson, they <laughs> buried that news on the infamous day of, uh, of uh, Tucker's uh, firing from Fox News. But, uh, but yeah, um, I, I don't know, maybe Ryan Seltzer's learned something from his time off. He's done some interesting uh, reporting from other outlets. Um, his, his, I think his writing is a lot more nuanced and compelling than the TV show was. Um, but uh, we'll, you know, we'll have to see if he's learned from his experience. And uh, Chris Cuomo, as you mentioned, is someone yes. now who's on our sister channel, uh, News Nation, and I think does some, a lot of really interesting interviews. Uh, with a whole range of, uh, of people. I, I think, not that I would wish being fired on anyone, but uh, he, I think, it learned from that experience and has really been able to, you know, broaden the, the t things he talks about and have, uh, he, did a, he did a discussion with Tucker, right? I, I think, uh, um, and with Dave Smith and with uh, a lot of interesting people who he's disagreed with on the past. So you can, um, you know, you can get, uh, you, you can learn and you can broaden your horizons and you can become a more interesting media figure. I've certainly learned a lot from doing this show in the, um, it, you know, in the time I've been doing it. I think I have a much less narrow perspective than I did when I started. I, I think I, I, I no longer you know, presume that people who are saying or have said things I've disagreed with in the past, well, that that necessarily means I'm going to always disagree with them. Or like, if, if I thought you were wrong about this, um, I, I have to assume you're wrong about everything. Might be I, I was more inclined to think that way in the past, and now I'm like, well, I disagree with them on this, but I do agree with them on this. That's part of just doing, you know, a debate show where you talk to people, you know, all over the political spectrum. Um, I think that's a I think that's a, ver a, a, a valid way to conduct oneself, and uh, we'll see if it makes the network any different. Yeah, certainly not many avenues for that kind of learning in mainstream media, but it does sound like from his own reflection, you know, Stelter learned something from his time away from being, you know, a Sunday news host. He said his time off and bumpy departure from CNN allowed him to experience the news more like an everyday consumer, which I guess is a very different perspective from telling the news versus, you know, reading it, reading what interests you. And he honed in his focus on the attention economy and the information ecosystem. So to think that he was further away from the attention economy and the information ecosystem when he was at CNN than when he was away from it, I think says more about CNN than anything, Robbie. Hmm. Well, that does it for us today on Rising. Thank you all for watching. We will be back tomorrow with another episode of our show. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, now available anywhere you can find podcasts. See you back here tomorrow. Bye, y'all.